Welcome to the next lecture in UAS Mapping for 3D Modeling course. Today we're going to talk about flight planning. We're going to create a flight plan that we're going to execute next week during our field exercise. Objectives for today's lecture and assignment. We're going to describe all phases of flight planning also, I'm going to stress the understanding of safety procedures and checklists to ensure that not only we're going to collect the best possible data, but our uh, flight will, will be executed safely for both UAS and people around. I'm going to go more into depth in the role of the ground control point so you can understand uh, how this the, it their distribution and accuracy can influence the data after processing. So what you should know before you even start the GCP surveying and before you start planning your flight. And the last part of the lecture will focus specifically on the flight planning software. So I will explain how to uh, use a, a specific software designed for our UAS that we're going to be flying next week. This is the slide you can recognize from previous lectures. I always stressed out how the UAS photogrammetric process needs to be treated as a whole and how throughout the whole process it's important to remember what is the aim, what do we want here at the end, and what the data will be used for. So here we are just at the beginning in the fly, flight planning phase, but before we start thinking about flight planning, we need to know what the data would be used for and what kind of analysis you would need to perform with that, what's the quality and what the other requirements needed throughout the whole photogrammetric process. Also, the flight planning itself is a multi-step process. The flight planning in software, what you can imagine that uh, would be, and what would be our assignment, just clicking the buttons, is just a small part of it. Before you even open the software, you need to think about multiple steps that I'm going to describe later. And after you even create the flight plan, there are still some, se some steps that need to be executed. They need to be ensured uh, the, um, about the successful performance of the mission and you need to plan ahead what you're going to do during these steps. Also, <laughs> just like on the slide before, even with, within the small part, which is the flight planning, you always need to remember and keep in mind why are you doing it, what it will be used for. We start with the first phase, which is project definition. You need to ask yourself multiple questions before you even start planning the flight. You need to define the scope of the project. You need to know why are you flying? What kind of data do you need? Uh, what, what's, what is the area that you are interested in? Then if you will know what kind of data you need, you accordingly, you will choose the proper platform, the UAS, and also the sensor that is needed for acquiring the data you need. Here in the classroom, we're limited because we already know what kind of UAS we're going to fly and what is our test field that we've, we have been flying there uh, multiple times in previous months and years. But if you are encountering a barrel, like new project with no previous data uh, and you have a budget and you need to think about what UAS do you want to use, uh, this is the right, uh, this is the right uh, place where you're going to start deciding. You have multiple options. Uh, you have the option to buy, you have the option to lease, if you don't already own uh, a UAS. 
you might be surprised that maybe if defining the scope of the project in the area, you might be not able to collect the data with the UAS you have or the UAS that you can afford or the UAS you can be thinking of. You can be also, uh, you can also encounter problems with sensor. Maybe the data you want to collect are beyond the reach of the simple RGB camera. You need to invest in different sensors. And then before you even start and go to the field, you can already know what's your problem and address it. The next step is assessing the cost, labor, and time consumption. It might be also the case that um, your project is not reasonable to undertake because it takes too much time, it costs too much, or you just don't have enough uh, in, budget big enough to undertake it. Um, even if you know it's in your capabilities, you need to assess um, how much time does it take you uh, to uh, fulfill all the requirements of the project? Uh, the next step is even before you even try to plan and um, utilize the planning software is to collect uh, the main information about terrain. So check if you haven't been there before, if you are just thinking about uh, or finding a new terrain, uh, you need to check if it's even possible uh, from the legal point of view to fly there or briefly it's if it's accessible from all the sources you can gather from uh, from Google Maps, from OpenStreetMap, or from um, accessible data. After you've decided that it's worth it to undertake the project, uh, your next step is to define the area and the resolution. The resolution of the final product, product that you are desired desiring to have. And you do it based on multiple uh, features. You do it first uh, analyzing the sensor capabilities and also the UAS capabilities. So some of them can have longer endurance. You can map a larger area. Some of them uh, you can fly just for a short time. So you need to adjust your area of interest to your UAS and sensor capabilities. Also, the size of a mapping area. If you are uh, determined to map the area with the boundaries you established before, maybe you need to go on a lower res resolution. Maybe you can work uh, for the scope of your project. It's not necessary to have the highest possible resolution. And uh, what's more important for you, the size that you are, uh, a the size of an area that you're able to map in short time or the resolution. You also have to take into account terrain constraints when you are defining the area. So um, some of the uh, parts of the terrain can be not accessible for uh, for the UAS. Also, in some of uh, it, it, the resolution needs to be higher in the uh, when the scope of the project takes into account a really diverse micro topography that you have to, uh, or other features that have a lot of details that you have to take into account uh, when establishing what's the uh, resolution and the area that you want to map. Also the project requirements. So what are you thinking about doing with the data? If you are, be, will be able to, you need to um, determine a, a single species or uh, see a leaf that has a disease. That's obviously that you need to have a really high resolution. And what is what follows this is that the area that you can map at the same time will be smaller. The next thing is maybe you can do it even before, but evaluating the legal constraints to even check if you are able to plan uh, to, to fly, plan the fly, flying there and obtaining permissions. It is. Um, it is useful to do it before when you are having this first uh, assessment of the terrain, but then after you plan exact area that you want to fly over, you need to make sure that uh, the legal constraints, like the, the property of the terrain and what kind of permissions you need to obtain in order to fly there. And this is the step that it's uh, 
uh, overlooked a lot of the times. So defining the coordinate system. Uh, I like to stress it uh, at the beginning because it saves us a lot of trouble on the way. Um, if you are the one that is, will be working with the data from the very beginning to the very end, including the um, analysis, and uh, uh, this will be just for you. It's all, all for you to decide what kind of coordinate system are you are you're going to be using or what is your standard for doing it. But if it's going to be passed to some state agencies or even to some private client or someone else to use it, you need to take into account that if you are sticking with one coordinate system all along the way, you save yourself a lot of trouble with uh, with mm, miscalculating, with making m mistakes that can be uh, easily over overlooked. Um, so, for example, the state agencies, they a lot you, in North Carolina use uh, NC state plane, but even in NC state plane, you have multiple coordinate system. You can have them in feet, in meters. You can also have US survey feet. That is a different measurement unit. And you always need to know what do they expect from you at the end? Or, or if you want to combine it with any other data, what is the coordinate system of the data that you will be combining it with? More, uh, more about it when we'll be talking about the GCPs collecting the data because you also need to collect them in certain coordinate system. So here I, I stated that it can be uh, dependent on the final data, but it also uh, it is ideal if it's consistent with the coordinate system of the GCP survey. Even if it's not, you always need to take a note and with each step of the processing, know uh, if you are doing the transformation and if you are doing it correctly. Now we move into the flight planning phase. Uh, flight planning phase of flight planning process. Uh, this is going to be uh, starting with the mission area assessment in the processing software or outside of the software if the software is not uh, efficient in that. It's what we're going to do with the flight planning um, in uh, in the second part of the assignment. We're going to put the flight plan into the GIS. Uh, also, the mission area assessment, uh, it's just a first look at the, where can I uh, take off? Where can I land? What's actually the, where is the place where I can easily access with my um, car to bring the, mm, the UAS if it's big enough that you can carry it or if it'll be easy for me to carry it uh, to the takeoff location. Uh, next, the planning of geometric parameters, it's it's strictly bound with what the software is required to you to uh, to input, and you cannot proceed from the next uh, next steps of the planning uh, software. It uh, it depends on the environment. Uh, where are you? If you are um, forced to input everything like the resolution or the flight attitude, usually the software will calculate a lot of the parameters for you. And this is also the thing that you are that it depends on your flight planning and flight logging platform. Uh, what if you are using a certain UIS, maybe you can have the capabilities of choosing. Sometimes you would just need to stick to the manufacturer uh, software. Uh, you can also find a flight logging platforms that are uh, online. Uh, there is a Skyward, there is a link to that in our main uh, topic um, under supplementary materials. It helps a lot with uh, when you are uh, having multiple missions, if it's not just one one time thing for your uh, assignment for your project, but if you are thinking seriously and professionally about using UAS for mapping or from other projects. There is also important to check the weather, maybe the long term forecast if you are planning to fly like next week. But sometimes you need to uh, you have a project that will be maybe long term you need to see what's the climate in, in this area, in what season um, you uh, when you live in this area. That's not probably you, you know it from your experience. But if you are uh, conducting research or having a project somewhere else, it's uh, 
it's important to know what weather you can expect and when to plan a mission. And then the last step of it is actually creating a, a flight plan in software. Of course, even in the software, you have to ha take into account all the, uh, you, you will be working with the mission area. You will be inputting the geometric parameters. Um, you are will be working with the software that you've chosen. And also some of the weather parameters can be inputted and then adjusted on the side that the software will recognize the weather conditions.